Chapter 50 of A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells The Reformation of the Latin Church The Latin Church itself was enormously affected by this mental rebirth. It was dismembered, and even the portion that survived was extensively renewed. We have told how nearly the Church came to the autocratic leadership of all Christendom in the 11th and 12th centuries, and how in the 14th and 15th its power over men's minds and affairs declined. We have described how popular religious enthusiasm, which had, in earlier ages, been its support and power, was turned against it by its pride, persecutions, and centralization, and how the insidious skepticism of Frederick II bore fruit in a growing insubordination of the princes. The great schism had reduced its religious and political prestige to negligible proportions. The forces of insurrection struck it now from both sides. The teachings of the Englishman Wycliffe spread widely throughout Europe. In 1398, a learned Czech, John Haas, delivered a series of lectures upon Wycliffe's teachings in the University of Prague. This teaching spread rapidly beyond the educated class and aroused great popular enthusiasm. In 1414-1418, a council of the whole church was held at Constance to settle the great schism. Huss was invited to this council under promise of a safe conduct from the emperor, seized, put on trial for heresy, and burnt alive, 1415. So far from tranquilizing the Bohemian people, this led to an insurrection of the Hussites in that country, the first of a series of religious wars that inaugurated the breakup of Latin Christendom. Against this insurrection, Pope Martin V, the Pope specially elected at Constance as the head of a reunited Christendom, preached a crusade. Five crusades in all were launched upon this sturdy little people, and all of them failed. All the unemployed ruffianism of Europe was turned upon Bohemia in the 15th century, just as in the 13th it had been turned upon the Waldenses. But the Bohemian Czechs, unlike the Waldenses, believed in armed resistance. The Bohemian Crusade dissolved and streamed away from the battlefield at the sound of the Hussites' wagons and the distant chanting of their troops. It did not even wait to fight. Battle of Domaslitz, 1431. In 1436, an agreement was patched up with the Hussites by the new council of the church at Basel, in which many of the special objections to Latin practice were conceded. In the 15th century, a great pestilence had produced much social disorganization throughout Europe. There had been extreme misery and discontent among the common people and peasant risings against the landlords and the wealthy in England and France. After the Hussite Wars, these peasant insurrections increased in gravity in Germany and took on a religious character. Printing came in as an influence upon this development. By the middle of the 15th century, there were printers at work with movable type in Holland and the Rhineland. The art spread to Italy and England, where Caxton was printing in Westminster in 1477. The immediate consequence was a great increase in distribution of Bibles and greatly increased facilities for widespread popular controversies. The European world became a world of readers to an extent that had never happened to any community in the past, and this sudden irrigation of the general mind with clearer ideas and more accessible information occurred just at a time when the church was confused and divided and not in a position to defend itself effectively, and when many princes were looking for means to weaken its hold upon the vast wealth it claimed in their dominions. In Germany the attack upon the church gathered round the personality of an ex-monk Martin Luther, 1483-1546 who appeared in Wittenberg in 1517, offering disputations against various orthodox doctrines and practices. At first, he disputed in Latin in the fashion of the schoolman. Then he took up the new weapon of the printed word, 
and scattered his views far and wide in German, addressed to the ordinary people. An attempt was made to suppress him, as Husk had been suppressed, but the printing press had changed conditions, and he had too many open and secret friends among the German princes for this fate to overtake him. For now, in this age of multiplying ideas and weakened faith, there were many rulers who saw their advantage in breaking the religious ties between their people and Rome. They sought to make themselves in person the heads of a more nationalized religion. England, Scotland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, North Germany, and Bohemia, one after another, separated themselves from the Roman communion. They have remained separated ever since. The various princes concerned cared very little for the moral and intellectual freedom of their subjects. They used the religious doubts and insurgents of the peoples to strengthen them against Rome, but they tried to keep a grip upon the popular movement as soon as that rupture was achieved and a national church set up under the control of the crown. But there has always been a curious vitality in the teaching of Jesus, a direct appeal to righteousness, and a man's self-respect over every loyalty and every subordination, lay or ecclesiastical. None of these princely churches broke off without also breaking off a number of fragmentary sects that would admit the intervention of neither prince nor pope between a man and his god. In England and Scotland, for example, there was a number of sects who now held firmly to the Bible as their one guide in life and belief. They refused the disciplines of a state church. In England, these dissentients were the nonconformists, who played a very large part in the polities of that country in the 17th and 18th centuries. In England, they carried their objection to a princely head to the church so far as to decapitate King Charles I, 1649, and for eleven prosperous years England was a republic under non-conformist rule. The breaking away of this large section of northern Europe from Latin Christendom is what is generally spoken of as the Reformation. But the shock and stress of these losses produce changes, perhaps as profound in the Roman Church itself. The Church was reorganized, and a new spirit came into its life. One of the dominant figures in this revival was a young Spanish soldier, Inigo López de Recalde, better known to the world as St. Ignatius of Loyola. After some romantic beginnings, he became a priest, 1538, and was permitted to found the Society of Jesus, a direct attempt to bring the generous and chivalrous traditions of military discipline into the service of religion. The Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, became one of the greatest teaching and missionary societies the world has ever seen. It carried Christianity to India, China, and America. It arrested the rapid disintegration of the Roman Church. It raised the standard of education throughout the whole Catholic world. It raised the level of Catholic intelligence and quickened the Catholic conscience everywhere. It stimulated Protestant Europe to competitive educational efforts. The vigorous and aggressive Roman Catholic Church we know today is largely the product of this Jesuit revival. End of chapter 15